Detective Sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A small boy is reported missing from his home. His age, nine years. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find him. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, December 22nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Thad Brown, chief detective. My name's Fred. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.55 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Frank, what's doing? Oh, nothing. Pretty quiet. How's your mother? Oh, that cold's still hanging on. Bad cough. Doc says nothing serious, though. My kid's got the same thing. Must be some kind of a virus going around. Yeah, maybe so. Did you get all the reports from that Webster case yet? Yeah. Yeah, all taken care of. Yeah. I get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Robinson, Unit 11J1. Got something for you. Yeah, Harry, what's doing? Doherty and I are out here on Hollis Avenue, 4656, trying to track down a nine-year-old boy. Well, what's the story? Kid's missing. Suspicion of foul play. Yeah? How long has he been gone? About two hours. Looks like a job for homicide. How do you figure? Uh, the kid was last seen playing in the backyard of his home. Yeah? We checked over the yard. Did you find anything? Blood stains, lots of them. They look new. Frank and I left a message for Chief of Detective Thad Brown. Then we went over to the crime lab, picked up Ray Pinker, and drove out the Arroyo Seco Freeway to Hollis Avenue. It was an average neighborhood. Number 4656 was a one-story green stucco residence situated on the corner of Hollis Avenue and Harrison Drive. Beyond the backyard was a tract of undeveloped land covered with scrub oak. Harry Levinson from Highland Park Juvenile was waiting for us in front of the house. Back this way, fellas. You coming, Ray? Well, I got my bag. Who notified you the boy was missing, Harry? The mother said she went down to do some Christmas shopping about 11 this morning, left the boy home. Came back about 2 this afternoon, he was gone. What's the name? Johnstone. The kid's name is Stanley, 9 years old. Uh, was the gate open like this when you got here? Yeah, we haven't got the thing. Yeah, the thing's over here, Mr. Pinker, along the edge of the walk there, you see? Yeah, let me see. There's quite a few stains. Huh? Looks like it might be blood. Try some benzidine on them. Frank and I questioned the boy's mother, Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early 40s. 
She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Mr. Johnstone, is your boy Stanley in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. When was the last time, Miss Johnstone? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, ma'am. Well, there comes that time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home. Go out on his own. Usually happens somewhere around 8 to 10. Yes, ma'am. I think I know what you mean. I'm a boy. Then you know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one afternoon after school, and he was quite put out about it. But George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. Well, how long was he gone, ma'am? Well, no time at all. About two hours. I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone. Said every boy had to go through that stage. Uh-huh. Well, then you think he's gone away from home again this time, do you? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now. You know, I have a funny feeling about it. Did you and his father happen to have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? Well, that's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you now that we're talking about it. I'm getting worried. Any place around that you might like to visit? A hobby shop or a playground? Something like that where you might be? Yes, there's Jensen's model shop, Little Helen Woods, but I've already called there and he hasn't been seen all day. I've called all of his friends and they have no idea either. Mm-hmm. We'd like a list of all of his friends and the places that he was known to frequent, ma'am. That's all right. I'll give them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where is your husband now, Mrs. Johnstone? At work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. Uh-huh. What house is he stationed at? Engine Company 12. He's working the A platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him that Stanley's gone. Was there any chance that the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No. He seldom goes down there anymore. No, I don't think he's there. I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Well, certainly. You go right ahead. I know George will be worried. Stanley's been gone too long. Well, hello. May I speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. I hate to call George at his work. Yes, sir. Does your husband want me to man? Yes, he does. What caliber would you know? It's a forty-five automatic. He's got it. Me. George? Well, this is Ruth. George, is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh, no, I can't find him anywhere. He wasn't here when I came home from doing my shopping. There are two policemen here. No, I said there are two policemen here. No, dear, I'll call you if we don't find him soon. Oh, all right. Yes, you too. Bye. I didn't think he'd be with George. Oh, that forty-five. is that the only gun in the household? Yes. Why are you asking about guns? Is anything happened that you're not telling me about? No, ma'am, just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that forty-five, if you don't mind. Maybe I should tell you we do have another gun in the house, but it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. Well, if we can look at it, please. Yes, will you have to unwrap it? I'm afraid so. I think I can reach it. Yeah, to hide it. Let me see. Well, here's the paper it was wrapped in. Standing like the farm, it is gone. You see? Here's the gift card in the box the gun came in. The rifle. Uh-huh. Could I look at the box, ma'am? Thank you. How about it, Joe? Twenty-two caliber. Thursday, December 22nd, 5.15 p.m. It was getting dark. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Levinson again. He'd been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood, but they'd found nothing. We went down to Hollop Avenue and 10th Street, service station on the corner. You want a dime, Joe? No, I got one. You watch the chief for honor. Yeah. Check 
Gentlemen? How's it going? We just checked with Ray Pinker. Yeah, I know. It's human blood. What do you think? We talked with the boy's mother, Mrs. Johnstone, found a gun missing. Yep. Caliber's the same as the empty case in Levinson found, 22. You said the gun was missing? Yeah, the Johnstones were going to give it to the boys at Christmas present. They had it hidden, but it's gone now. Any idea who took it? Well, over it was. They left the Christmas wrapping behind. I think maybe it was a kid. 22 rifle, huh? Nine-year-old boy. When are we going to learn? First, it's carbide cannons on the 4th of July. The city issued ordinance after ordinance, but a few thousand kids around the country had to lose their eyes, fingers, hands, before the parents could give us their full cooperation to outlaws. I know what you mean. Sure you do. You and every other cop in the country became the heavy trying to clamp down on them. It's always the same story. This time it's guns for Christmas. Oh, I know what you're thinking, Chief, but we're not sure yet. Listen, Friday, there's a city ordinance against giving a gun to a kid. Now, you know that. Yeah, I know that. There's a missing boy and a missing gun. There's blood on the ground and an empty shell. That's enough for me. We're going to stay with it, Chief. Something's got to break. Yeah. I hope it's not the house of that kid's parents. All right, Chief. I've been looking for you, Friday. Yeah, you know, what do you got, Harry? Found a gun, a new twenty-two rifle. I'd say it's been fired recently. Where'd you find it, Levinson? Back up there in that scrub oak behind the Johnstone house. Mrs. Johnstone identified it. Buckley took it down to the crime lab. Well, thanks, Harry. Miss Johnstone, okay? She's pretty sick now. Kelly came up with something else. What's that? There's another one missing. An eight-year-old boy. Six thirty p.m. We talked with Officer Killaby about the other missing boy. He told us that his name was Stephen Martin, eight years old. His family had just moved into the neighborhood. It seemed that no one besides the Martin family knew that the boys played together. Mrs. Martin told us that Stephen told her that he was going out to play and he'd be home by six o'clock for dinner. She told us that he was an unusually prompt boy and almost never overstayed his playtime. We got a description of the Martin boy and put out a missing broadcast. We called the Johnstone family doctor. He told us that Stanley's blood was type O. At 7 p.m., we talked again with Mrs. John Martin. Are you sure Mrs. Johnson doesn't know where the boys are? She has no idea, Mrs. Martin. Oh, this is terrible. Just awful. I feel there's more to this thing, something you're not telling me. Well, there's no use to upset you until we know a few more things for sure, ma'am. Then you are holding something back. Well, please try not to worry, Mrs. Martin. There's certain questions we have to ask, routine questions in any kind of investigation. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, ma'am. What's your boy's blood type? Funny question. Do you think anything's happened to him? Have you found him and you're not telling me? No, ma'am. We haven't found him. And we don't think anything's happened to him. His blood type, huh? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think I have it written down in Stevie's baby book. Um, yes. Yes, here it is. The type is O. Type O, thank you. I wonder if I can use your phone. Oh, yes, of course. It's in the hall. Be right back, Frank. Yes. Yeah. something else that's completely modern about Chesterfield. People smoke. that there was no 
little cause to add to their distress at this particular time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the bloodstains and the cartridge would be of no concern to the relief panel. At 8.40 p.m., Frank and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Martin. Mrs. Martin, you said your husband worked at the market. Yes. He telephoned about 15 minutes ago and said he was closing up right away. He'll be here any minute. I do wish Stevie would call or come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton jacket. Well, try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. He'll be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. And the boy is so close. I know he's terribly upset. Yes, ma'am. Are you sure there's no place you might have forgotten? Some place where the boy might be? No. No place. No. If anything's happened to the boy, it'll just kill John. Mrs. Martin. Uh, you sit still. I'll get it. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, Harry. John's done case. He's been found. <laughs> Sergeant, he's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No. No, he didn't. His clothes are all dirty and he's acting strange. I've never seen him like this. How do you mean, Mrs. Johnston? Well, he just came in the front door and said, Hello, Mom, and then he sat down in a chair and stared at the floor. He talked to his father and me. You mind if I talk to him? No, go ahead. I asked him about the little Martin boy. He wouldn't tell me a thing. Well, where is he now? Right over there in the living room. Oh, yeah. Looks all right. Yes. Son. Son, this is a police officer. He wants to talk to you. Don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Stanley? Come on, boy, look at me. Come on, youngster, get your head up. No, that's better. You have your mother pretty worried, you know that? You want to tell us where you've been? I wish you'd try to get him to eat a little something. You hear that, son? You want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the street who hasn't come home. Do you know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too, just like your folks were. You've got to help us find him, son. I killed him. I killed him with the twenty-two. Went on and killed him, but I killed him. Well, how do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt now, isn't he? No. He's dead. I'm really dead. The gun went off. We forgot we put bullets in there. Well, where is he, Stanley? I hit him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. Where did you hide him, son? In a cave up on the hill. I didn't mean it. He was my pal. Do you want to show us where, Stanley? Yes, sir. I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone led the way up the hill behind the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he'd moved the body in. His father came along with us. About 50 feet from the crest of the hill, the boy pointed to a thicket of scrub oak. There we found a small cave holding the body of Stephen Martin. There was a single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. We covered the body. Stanley, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. I knew my folks were going to give me a bill for Christmas. I knew where it was and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing a gun at Stephen's son? No, sir. No, no, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him. He tripped over that stump and he fell. The gun hit him in the stomach and went off. Now, why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth here? I'm telling the truth. Honest, it's the truth. All right, I believe you, son. Why do you think you killed him? My gun. He stood me life. I didn't go get it. I should have waited for Christmas. It's all my fault. Where have you been all this time? In the cave. With Steve. What were you doing in there, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make him alive again. <laughs> After a thorough investigation, Frank and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Martin was accidental. Ray Pinker's findings substantiated the Johnstone boy's story, even to the smallest detail. 
We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Martin home. Mrs. Martin collapsed. The family doctor was called. Frank and I sat in the living room to wait for John Martin, the dead boy's father. Peter? Peter? Mr. Martin? Yes. You the police? Yes, sir. Where's Edith? Where's my wife? Has my boy come home? Well, have you found him? Yes, sir. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Well, what's it all for? 
true, Joe. You don't give a kid a gun for Christmas. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 24th, the coroner's inquest was held in the county morgue, county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. At the coroner's inquest, it was officially recorded that Stephen Martin's death was the result of an accident. Stanley Johnstone was absolved of any legal responsibility for his friend's death. Her Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, William Johnstone, Sammy Ogg. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking.